I talked this morning about the media prejudice against Christianity and Christians as reflected in the movies and their shift from Protestantism to anti-Christianity. That doesn't cover the entire subject, of course. For in our first talk, uh, we admitted to say anything about newspapers. Let's suffice to say that at the turn of the century until 1917, newspapers used to regularly report the substance of Christian sermons and the activities of large Christian churches in the metropolis and, of course, in thousands of lesser towns across the country, and that that practice slowly dwindled away by the late 30s. Until then, however, newspaper writers were very cautious regarding Christians, and they made efforts not to offend, not to denigrate. And they continued to cite leading theologians and ministers, Catholic dignitaries and the like, in very respectful terms. They did not headline scandals in the church, nor divisions in the churches. Today, however, the secular newspaper treatment of Christianity and Christians is as dismal as is Hollywood's. In fact, the difference could not be detected with a microscope. (laughs) The newspaper industry, the movie industry, the television and cable industries, the magazine and book publishing industries have all changed in the same direction, anti-Christian and pro-Marxist. And where we once had thousands of newspapers with many diverse personalities and viewpoints, we now have 1,700 that are remarkably similar in outlook and expression. We have a media phenomenon, a free press that speaks with one voice. (laughs) Only a few dissenting newspapers remain. The late William Loeb in New Hampshire published an outspoken, idiosyncratic paper, and his dissonance aroused the most vitriolic hatred in the liberal to Marxist press. The anti-traditionalist could not endure even one dissonant voice. The Oklahoman in Oklahoma City is a conservative newspaper, and it is treated as though it doesn't exist. Its editorials and its articles are never picked up and repeated. It's never mentioned. Even the cartoonists on that paper, Labor and Darkness, as far as the rest of the media is concerned. In overall terms, most of the nation's 1,700 newspapers are monopolies. That is to say, they appear in one newspaper towns. There are less than three dozen American cities where two or more newspapers compete. The remaining papers are practically all owned by huge communications conglomerates, which function with one eye on advertising and the other to wire service features and entertainments. At the current rate, writes Hodding Carter III, who is himself descended from a famous newspaper family, individually owned newspapers will constitute less than 10% of the total by the year 2000. When we consider that the two major wire services contribute the bulk of the events mentioned on television, and that these same events are headlined at the same time in our local paper, we begin to see that the channels by which we receive information about both ourselves and the rest of the world have greatly narrowed. The same personalities, meanwhile, dominate the news, the same books, the same movies, the same writers. And this is true whether we watch television, listen to the radio, read newspapers, buy magazines or books, or go to the movies. Now this is a very eerie, unprecedented situation in a free society. 
In Moscow, the citizens know that the government controls the media. And here, we know only that huge communications conglomerates, themselves owned by even larger groups, control the organs through which we receive the news. And in this towering interlock of finance, industry, advertising, and promotion, Christianity is considered to be both irrelevant and unimportant. The corporate executives who control the media consider content unimportant because they have contempt for the audience. They respond only to power blocks to organize pressure groups to those who can influence advertising. And they believe that the press corps, which consists of a self-created elite whose attitudes are hostile to the majority of Americans, are irreplaceable. When Christians rise to claim a voice in public affairs, this monolithic media scream about intolerance and walls of separation and unconstitutionality. The majority of American citizens are told, in effect, that the beliefs by which they live and seek to transmit to their children are outlawed from the nation's intellectual life and from the media. At this moment, United Press International, one of our two major wire services, is awaiting governmental approval of its sale from American owners to a Mexican Marxist financier. Even Washington, as intellectually and morally enfeebled as it is, is pondering whether to allow that sale to go through. For even blind and bureaucratic Washington knows that to have open, official, dedicated Marxists funneling disinformation into one of our two major wire services would be to pour undiluted poison into the mind of the nation. But that's a matter of degree. Would open Marxism be worse than the covert Marxism we now receive, mostly in the form of omissions of significant aspects of events, from the wire services, radio, TV, books, and films, I wonder. On the surface, therefore, it would appear that ours is a lost cause, but that's only on the surface. This is an illusion. It is as much of an illusion as the figures on the great stereophonic screens that stretch across the wall in a movie house, as the shadows on Plato's cave. As much of an illusion as the instant celebrity of Dan Rather appearing on TV screens every night. Let him vanish from those screens for a month, and his celebrity would vanish with his image. The great communications conglomerates are similarly illusory. They are paper empires. They have to pump out sensation after sensation, detail after detail, scandal after scandal, to retain an audience that grows steadily wearier of being entertained instead of informed, propagandized instead of enlightened. Meanwhile, a new phenomenon is emerging in the form of the Christian response. It was not immediate, not spectacular, did not appear with a roar of sound and a blaze of pu publicity. Twenty years ago, when Dr. Rush Dooney started his Chalcedon Report, most church bulletins were simply that. Most denominational magazines were aimed at a special audience. Books on theology remained in formidable volumes in publishers' catalogs. Christians seemed to be asleep while their enemies pranced on center stage. But that, too, was an illusion. For no group of minority organizations can challenge the religious beliefs that strengthen a great nation without eventually evoking a response. 
That response, however, came here in a new form. It did not come in the form of wealthy Christians buying newspapers of their own, or moving into a major Hollywood studio, or setting up a communications conglomerate to challenge the liberal Marxists. It came first in the form of a flow of steady departures from the mainline churches, from the members of the National Council of Churches. It came in the form of new Christian churches and in the growth of new private Christian schools. In the beginning, all this came, in the words of the Bible, like a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And that reference is not irrelevant, for it is part of the description in Kings 18, where Elijah called upon the Lord to smite the priests of Baal, who had achieved a temporary dominance over the people of ancient Israel. And as you know, the priests of Baal, Baal represented the state. The new churches and the new schools were created out of reaction to the ecclesiastical and societal trends whipped into motion by a culmination of the bureaucrats and the media. And in my view, these new Christian institutions were a direct response to the media. It's also, I think, fairly obvious that dissatisfaction with the mainline churches came from their combination of cooperation with the fashions set by the media and their inability to defend the faith or to make the faith relevant to the problems of our time. The new churches burgeoning across the land could not ignore contemporary problems. They were created to bring the faith to bear upon such problems. And therefore, their pastors began to issue small newsletters on their own, largely in the beginning, to keep their congregations apprised of the latest developments in the field of Christian education and other issues. These publications broke the bounds of the church bulletins that until then had become the custom. They appeared in the wake of each new church, each new school, and they sprang up in communities across the land. These groups and their modest publications remind me of what Christopher Dawson once said about the ways of God. God's methods, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, can be cerned in their remoteness from the ways of man, in their indirect and unexpected directions. For instance, man's way of spreading the Gospels would have been for Jesus and the Apostles to go to the court of Caesar, where their message could be taken down by the stenographers and copied into the manuscript form prevalent at the time, and then distributed throughout the great empire. Instead, Jesus spoke first to the Apostles and then to crowds within the physical proximity of his voice. And then later he threw the apostles upward like so many seeds to be carried by the wind, which create great forests where formerly nothing had grown. In this way, the new churches and their schools began to blossom and to increase and their publications began to move from typescript to print to color to sections to wire services. For there are now Christian wire services. There are Christian magazines. There are Christian newspapers and seminars. This seminar is only one of hundreds, perhaps thousands, across the country. Before I came here, I received an invitation to attend a seminar titled Revival of Christianity and the Reformation of Society. The Reformation of Society. The steering committee consisted of 64 ministers and Christian spokesmen representing as many organizations. And the titles of their talks are very different 
from the fossilized versions of Christianity that prevailed for so many relatively silent decades. Glancing briefly, my eye fell on Priorities for the 80s by Constitutional Attorney John Whitehead of the Rutherford Institute and How Public Education's Worldview Has Destroyed the Christian Family by the head of the National Association of Christian Educators. And Idolatry, Biblical and Contemporary, by author Herbert Schlossberg. And How Christian Unity Could Change the Country, by Connie Marshner, editor and lecturer. And The Influence of Godly Women in This Generation, by D. Jepson, formerly on the White House staff and Christian Conquest of the World by the Reverend Rushdoni. <laughs> and 59 more titles and speakers, which time does not allow me to continue to list. But the titles alone tell you that a new spirit is moving. And for this we can in part thank the enemies of Christianity. They are awakening the Christian majority of the United States to the realization that the revolutionary tide that enslaved Christians in over half the world is coursing through our society today. Until the propaganda really engulfed us, Christians in this nation continued to use a special artificial church language in our faith continue to use Victorian expressions when we preached or prayed, in contrast to the everyday language in which we conversed or wrote in general society. That was a symptom of a paralyzed faith, a faith disconnected from the world, <laughs> a faith that did not answer its critics, a faith that elevated kenosis or the doctrine of surrender and deceit. But when Christians discuss contemporary issues, when they bring their faith to bear upon the situation of society, when their lang then their language becomes fresh and relevant. For we face problems unknown to the his Victorians. We face what Dostoevsky called devils crawling across the landscape. I think it's clear that the Christian response is not as yet sufficient to overcome. But there is a response. And I need not remind you that the Christian Broadcasting Network grew from a very tiny enterprise in Virginia Beach into the fourth television network. Some publication experts were recently hired by the Fieldstead Institute to test CBN's marketing potential. <coughs> and they ran some test ads about some very high-level publications, literary magazines, and they reported back that the CBN audience resulted in more sales than any of the big three commercial networks. Well, of course, the Christian audience is a reading audience, a thinking audience, a serious audience. And the networks have the idiot audience. <laughs> but of course we are also an audience that have waited an awfully long time for Christian writers, musicians, and composers, <coughs> painters, and intellectuals, and performers producers and filmmakers to rise in defense of the faith, to say nothing of waiting for clergymen. <laughs> but they are now beginning to appear, and every month more appear. There is a remarkable rise of the Reverend Jerry Falwell, unknown to the nation a decade ago, who once told his congregation in Virginia that Christians should not be involved in politics. <laughs> but 
His moral majority united clergymen in all parts of the nation in a political crusade that registered several million new Christian voters in the primaries of 1980. And these voters are credited with Reagan's first election victory. And there are other evangelists on national television with followings estimated to be in the millions. Their rise has alarmed some anti-Christians. Norman Lear, a television producer whose first big hit, All in the Family, was an imitation of a far better and more innovative British program, organized an organization called People for the American Way, as though the real American way has ever been anti-Christian or non-Christian, and is trying to label Christianity as intolerant and Christians in politics as unconstitutional. That argument, by its very feebleness, the hollow nature, shows how empty it can be. Christianity is not a religion confined to a single cultural group, to a single race, to a single geographical location, to a single civilization. Christianity welcomes all men as brothers, embraces all races, accepts all cultures, all civilizations, believes and worships one God who is the Father and protector of all mankind. How could that be intolerant? The constitutional argument is equally fallacious. The Constitution's First Amendment does not simply cover establishment journalists and the communication conglomerates. It covers the right to worship, the right to take part in the political processes of the nation. If we were to rise to demand that other religionists cease to identify themselves in politics, if we were to say that those who believe in other religions should not create political organizations, or accuse them of dragging their religious beliefs into politics, we would deserve Norman Lear's accusations. On the other hand, we know that all law, all morality, all standards of right and wrong are based on religious principles. And as Christians, we have a right to protest when the nation on, in which we comprise the majority enacts or upholds assaults upon our morality our right to participate politically, our right to cultural self-expression, our right to organize, our right to speak and to be heard. But the Christian newsletters that I referred to did not attack. They reported. They defended. They did not organize at first. They simply stated the contemporary situation, and they grew and multiplied and improved. Practice makes perfect, and writing conveys its own improvement. Last week, Dr. Rush Juni handed me a representative sampling of such Christian newsletters, taken at random from his very heavy accumulated mail. They were remarkable. One was the Jews for Jesus newsletter. This group, which is spread across the nation, occupies a seven-story building on East 31st Street in Manhattan. The building has a plaque which reads, Jews for Jesus, established 32 A.D., give or take a year. Central Midtown East Side Branch. <laughs> Inside, there was a discussion of this newsletter of the Passover, which said in part, and I quote, The purpose of remembering, remembering the Passover was not to focus attention on our slavery and deliverance. It was similar to the reason Christians are to contemplate Calvary, to remember the Redeemer. Unless our remembrance brings us to the consciousness of God, 
it can lead into imageless idolatry. By remembering oppression and our survival of it in a ritualistic way without God, we can stumble into ethnolatry, where a people venerates its peoplehood and exalts its own existence as something holy in itself. Finally, says the article, very brief, instead of remembering the male children slaughtered, we need to remember that a multitude were redeemed, rescued, and revived out of the land of Egypt. Instead of reciting morbid litanies over the six million murdered by Hitler, we need to remember that 12 million survived." End quote. Those are remarkable Christian reminders published out of that modern Sodom, San Francisco, where Jews for Jesus have their national headquarters. But that paradox should not surprise us. After all, St. Paul traveled, preached, and proselytized during the reign of Nero. We, too, struggle against a pagan governing elite. But Christian newsletters are now appearing in every region of the land. Russia's samples included Intercessors for America from Reston, Virginia, The Pathway News from Tennessee, Pulpit Helps from Tennessee also with a circulation of over 200,000 carrying a front page article saying, will Christians demonstrate that their religion is not just a private and personal matter? A publication called Good News from Georgia. The Tim LaHaye Report discussing how federal judges are selected and other items from Washington. Another called Idea Inc. from Madison, Wisconsin, and so on and so on. One has the title, The Midnight Alarm, which I consider very expressive. Another is the Open Doors News Service from Orange, California, which carries news the major media outlets ignore. For instance, a dispatch from Uganda described the random murder of a Ugandan minister and proceeded to say that since its independence, a half million Ugandans, many of them Christian, have been murdered. Another dispatch talked of a crackdown on the underground Christian church in Saudi Arabia, where Christianity is officially banned. This article goes on to describe the Saudi religious police who seek to break up any secret Christian meeting. It tells of how anti-Christianism is so fierce in that land that buildings whose structure resemble a cross have to be redesigned. And yet the government of the United States has never once registered a protest or taken any official notice of these habitual, deliberate violations of human rights, even when they impinge upon the American military and the American embassy personnel. Only cursory notice is taken by the media and our government of anti-Christian campaigns and persecutions in other lands. Three Christian missionaries in Greece are facing a three-year prison term for giving a Bible to a Greek citizen. The governments of both the USSR and Red China have assumed control of the church and infiltrated its clergy with policemen who impersonate clergymen. Unlicensed clergymen are sent to concentration camps, tortured or executed. John Bunyan, you will recall, was jailed during the reign of Charles I for preaching without a license, and in prison wrote Pilgrim's Progress. That was once taught to all American schoolchildren. But that was a long time ago. The revival of these ancient anti-Christian cruelties have aroused no demonstrations in our universities, no protests by our diplomats, and relatively few articles in the media. I have never seen, nor do I expect to see in the near future, 
a documentary on major television of Christian persecutions around the world. These atrocities, however, are now being reported by the thousands of Christian publications that have mushroomed into existence in the last decade. The Chalcedon Report, pioneer in such efforts, is read in Switzerland and South Africa, England and Australia, Spain and New Zealand, Sweden and in other lands as well. Our mail is international, and so is that of many other publications that report on national, state, local, and international issues, events, and personalities. This American example cannot be followed in many other regions, for we still enjoy freedoms unknown in most of the world. The emerging Christian voice in the United States, therefore, is in the form of these new publications, which circulate and provide information and hope to people in other lands. But as you know, our traditional American freedoms are being seriously threatened by our bureaucracy, assisted by the courts and the media. Christians in Denver have been indicted for holding Bible studies in their homes under the guise of violating zoning ordinances. <coughs> Can you imagine the adherents of any other religion being so indicted? I have heard of none. But the Denver issue is not unique. A church nursery school in California was invaded by a SWAT team for operating without a license. Christian pastors have been jailed, denied lawyers for their defense, denied the right to testify for operating unlicensed Christian schools. This campaign of the bureaucracy, which will brook no area of national life it does not control, and in which believes that all that it does not officially permit is forbidden, is ignored by the establishment media. The Christian response, however, is from the bottom and not the top. The Christian publications I've cited are produced by groups ignored by the media, unmentioned on TV, unknown to the movies. There has been a huge revival underway which stretches all the way across the West. Our Chalcedon man in Switzerland, Jean Marc Bartou, reports that Christians there are uniting across denominational lines to reverse the secular trends in French Switzerland. And I have yet to see that reported in the New York Times. And when the resurgent Christians appear to testify in Washington or make a rare television appearance, they are always flanked by clerics with media-inflated reputations who are eager to argue against Reconstruction or against the idea of a Christian majority making itself heard in the land. They argue, as the media argues, that this would be somehow discriminatory or anti-democratic. Yet we were taught that democracy consists of a society governed only with its own consent, a society where the will of the majority prevails so long as the rights of minorities are protected, a society where the majority are ignored, where their expression is stifled, where their traditional beliefs are mocked, where minority rights prevail over all others is a tyranny, not a democracy. And although we can cite a growing number of Christian voices, impressive, eloquent, and brave, we have a long way to go. When John Lofton asked Jean Kirkpatrick about her religious beliefs in an interview for the Washington Times, the shock was felt across the country. When he repeated this in an interview with William Bennett, the Secretary of Education, indignant reactions were heard even from conservatives. Mr. Lofton had broken a taboo. He had mentioned not only religion in public, but Christianity. 
the Christian faith, it appears, had been tacitly outlawed from public discussion. A reporter could ask the President of the United States any question that comes to mind. But a lesser official, or as in the case of Mrs. Kirkpatrick, not even a, a, even a non-official, should not be publicly questioned about her religious beliefs. What sort of nonsense is this? People in high places who are members of our governing class in or out of office should tell people the basis for their attitudes, judgments, and behavior. I recall when the religion editor of the New York Times was considered by many to be openly anti-Christian, but nobody could tell me what religion the religious editor believed in, if any, or what religious background he inherited from his forebears. Yet no information is more pertinent than to know the author's position or the reporter's position when he writes or interviews on religion. Lofton's brave violation of a long-standing taboo marks an important stage of the Christian response to the media. And the fact that it emerged from a working journalist who is a Christian convert is important proof that a convert in our time today is not going to be content with pietism while the world burns. These are important developments. They mark a diminution in the high tide of anti-Christianity. They are still rare enough to evoke surprise in many, but they are increasing. Joe Sobrin, one of the most eloquent voices in American journalism today, recently wrote a column answering Charles Krauthammer. Krauthammer, who is a leading intellectual journalist, had written that the Pope's visit to an Italian synagogue was a nice gesture, but not enough for the Pope had failed to speak in favor of Israel. Krauthammer then proceeded to speak about, quote, 2,000 years of Christian anti-Semitism, end quote. At this, Sobrin protested. He spoke of the millions of Jews who voluntarily lived among Christians through the centuries because Christianity has always honored ancient Israel and the people among whom our Savior was born and reared. He also drew attention to the historical fact that collisions between Christians and Jews were not entirely one-sided, that hostility arose on both sides on repeated occasions, citing instances from the record. In this, Sobrin was doing what a Christian should do, answering false charges with the truth, in calmness, and with proof. The Lord expects that of all believers. Sobern and Lofton are not the only Christian columnists on the national scene. Cal Thomas, who formerly worked with Jerry Falwell, is syndicated by the Los Angeles Times. And that's proof that even the most left-leaning papers are aware of the Christian community. A decade ago, Cal Thomas wouldn't have been allowed to even visit the editor of the L.A. Times Syndicate. And a writer as outspoken as Joe Sobern would have been completely blacklisted. We can say, therefore, that the Christian presence in this nation, once so diminished in the view of academia and the media, that one professor, Dr. Bell, actually wrote a book titled The Post-Christian Era. But now the Christian community is too large and too impressive to be ignored. Still, we have a long way to go. For though victory is certain, it is not necessarily certain for us. We know as Christians that the faith cannot be extinguished, that the church, which is the body of Christ, cannot be destroyed. We see proof of that inside the very heart of the dragon, in the USSR and in Red China, in those lands where Christians are imprisoned, tortured, and executed, Christianity nevertheless remains alive. 
But distant examples are not enough, nor does history tell us about tomorrow. No generation knows as much history as we do today. We have before us the records of the ages. We have unearthed the birthplace of Abraham in the Middle East and examined the tablets of ancient Ur from which he wandered. We have seen the rise and fall of kingdoms and empires, not just in the past, but in our own time. We have witnessed the fall of Great Britain, the most far-flung empire the world has ever known. And we have seen the rise of the greatest anti-Christian power since the time of Genghis Khan and the Mongols. At that time, the Mongols appeared irresistible. They sent their spies ahead in the guise of merchants, and those reported back the strength of each city and country and region, the manner in which the defenses were distributed, their weak points and their strong, and how they could be most quickly overcome. So they swept across the steppes of Russia and the lands of Eastern Europe and conquered to the very gates of Budapest. Against them, the West could only rally knights in armor, so cumbersome they had to be lifted into the saddles of their horses with block and tackle. These clumsy warriors lined up like so many sheep waiting for the Mongol slaughter when the hand of God intervened. In far-off Mongolia, Genghis Khan, the supreme leader, died in his tent from a stroke. And the Mongol generals then rode back to elect a new Khan. And at that election, they decided not to expand their possessions any further, but to divide them and to rule over them. So the Mongol forces at Budapest were recalled, and Western Europe was saved. But that example is not, in my opinion, a good one upon which to rely. God does not always intervene. As we know, he allowed the Christians of Tsarist Russia to fall under the domination of the cruelest regimes, which after nearly 70 years has grown into an international menace. No generation dares to assume the mercy of God, whose vision stretches far beyond the contemporary. It may even be possible that because we allowed the enemies of Christianity so loud and persistent a voice without a brave response, that we could be asked to go through a period of suffering. Ancient Israel worshipped the golden calf while Moses was receiving the Decalogue from God, and the Israelites were punished with forty years in the desert. That lesson was repeated over and again. A society that forgets God is punished until it remembers. There is no guarantee that our efforts will be successful, but there is every guarantee that if they are not made, we shall all lose in this world and leave the struggle and the eventual victory to our children or their children. In that case, we would go down in history as an ignoble, unworthy generation. The lesson to me is that God rewards those who keep his commandments and who defend his interests. The brave knights who faced certain death at Budapest were spared because they were willing to die for the faith of their society. The Spaniards fought the Turks at Lepanto and God gave them the victory because they believed enough to fight. The Christian response to the media, therefore, must expand must increase, must be continued. We cannot forget that no army can be rallied, no movement launched, no effort prevail without the arguments, the battle cries, the songs and the banners, and the drums of eloquent defense of the faith. Thank you very much.